All right, it is uh, Ross and Jono with you again. And uh, today, you know, in light of current events, we want to talk about Amalek, as evident by the top of the screen. Uh, and the reason why is because whenever there is an attack uh, like this, and, you know, an attack like this, I mean, this is the worst attack on Israel since uh, the Holocaust, but uh, on, on the Jews since the Holocaust. And yep. uh, nevertheless, um, this is not an isolated incident. I mean, Hamas is constantly sending rockets and uh, staging attacks and so on and so forth. It's just, unfortunately, this is uh, a very successful attack by Hamas. And um, But whenever there is an event like this, um, Israel's enemies are figuratively referred to as Amalek. And we thought yeah. it might be opportune just to revisit the Hebrew Bible and find out, well, what, what exactly, who, who is Amalek? Uh, what are the relative passages and, uh, and, and what can we learn from uh, these stories uh, in regards to the rules of war as far as the, the Hebrew Bible is concerned? There's a lot of people are wondering, you know, how exactly do we deal with this situation? We want to support yeah. Israel. We want them to be victorious. But we hear all of this stuff about uh, um, uh, war crimes and, and, and all of this sort of nonsense. So uh, if we can find some sort of clarity or at least what is the position of the Hebrew Bible? And then maybe if we have time, we might touch on uh, how does the Moses Scroll differ, Ross? Yeah, I think, uh, I think you nailed it. One of the things that, that I was reminded of almost immediately from October the 7th until today, whenever I hear the reports, and, and many of us have spent a lot of time just digging into everything coming out, every different media source, looking at Twitter uh, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I'm chasing down these uh, these Twitter hashtags and watching gruesome videos coming out of the other side. Mm. And one thing that struck me from the very beginning, Jonah, was this idea of Amalek. And it, it's the, what are the characteristics of biblical Amalek and why did our minds go to Amalek? So, I think if we can start off, Jono, by reading the story uh, as it comes to us in the biblical narratives, just kind of hit mm. the high points on Amalek, I think people will see the association that we're talking about. Most, most people who listen to our show are very biblically literate, and we're going to hopefully have some of their insights as well. We've got mm. uh, an audience full of guest stars, as Seth likes to call them. And uh, we're going to ask for their opinion on some of this as well. So you, you want to kick us off? I say we begin in the Pentateuch, and uh, so unless you there. have something else. No, no, let's let's start there because, um, I mean, there are some questions as to what are the origins of Amalek. The, um, as I understand it, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we have any archaeological evidence for them specifically. Uh, and there are some who uh, wonder if they even existed at all or, or – or, if if the stories that uh, came about came later, as sort of yeah. uh, an allegory of of Israel's enemies, um, you know, we can explore that perhaps a little bit. But um, the the first place to go to would be that uh, I think it's Esau's grandson um, who is Amalek, and the Amalekites are one explanation is to be understood that they're just simply the descendants of uh, Esau's grandson. Is that is that your understanding? Yeah, I think I think at least that's the way we get the the story presented to us in the patriarchal narratives. We we are exposed to this this name, and uh, you you know it's it we don't we're not introduced to them as an enemy of Israel like in Genesis. However, we do see that it's related to the line of Esau, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that the way, you, you know, when we look at the genealogies, I think that's, that's where we first encounter it. Mm -hmm. but, but by the time we get to the Exodus narratives, then we're introduced to them as a people. And I think they become the archetypical, uh, the arch enemy of Israel because of their behavior at that juncture in the, uh, the history of Israel. So, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. so, but, but, but so there are debates. There are debates. People say, well, I mean, could it be that this people, uh, that Amalek just becomes the, the name or the designation for the arch enemy? Uh, and it could be. It could be. 
But it's certainly, certainly throughout history, Israel has had those uh, who seek its destruction. And we're going to make that direct association with what we see today. Right. So the initial um, or, or, or the narrative that appears first, of course, is Exodus chapter 17, if I remember correctly. And uh, this takes place, we're to understand, when Israel is leaving Egypt. Um, I, it appears they've left Egypt and they're tired, they're weary, uh, they've had to flee. Um, they're, they're, they're in the wilderness and uh, it seems that they are then pursued by Amalek, the Amalekites. And in the pursuit, uh, those who are particularly weary, the, uh, the aged, uh, the very young, uh, those who may be sick, um, are, are what's referred to, I think, as the stragglers at the back, and they end yeah. up being taken out by Amalek. Do you want to read that passage, Ross? Yeah, I, th I think so. I, I think, of course, there's there's quite a bit we could cover, but to your point, uh, Exodus chapter 17, did you want to cover it from verse 8? I think it's. I think we ought to. I think we ought to read that passage. So, so what we have is, by the way, one thing that I've heard various teachers point out, I have probably have taught this in times past, immediately preceding this attack from Amalek is a passage, and the people say, they, the children of Israel tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? You know, mm -hmm. it's this doubt that God is there to help them. And then immediately thereafter, and many Bible teachers, rabbis, sages have said, don't ever doubt that God is with you because this is what happens. So it says, verse 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose out men, go fight, fight with Amalek tomorrow. I'll stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Yehoshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone, put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun." And Yehoshua, Joshua, harried Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Now, here's the, the, the passage we want to get into. And the Lord, or Jehovah, said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a scroll and rehearse it in the ears of Yehoshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. And Moses built uh, an altar and called the name of it Adonai Nisi, or Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. For he said, Kiyad al Kes, Kiyad al Kes, Ya Milkama la Adonai ba Amalek mi dor dor. He said, Because there is a hand against the throne, literally, or a hand upon the throne. There will be war um, between Jehovah or two against for Jehovah with Amalek from a generation of a generation. Very interesting passage. It, it hints at, now this is something I wanted to ask you, Jonah. It's not really a declarative statement on my part, but when I read this, and James Tabor and others have, we've talked about this, in fact, David Horowitz made a big deal out of this passage mm. in his research, David Horowitz, founder of United Israel, mm. that there seems to be in this verse room for the interpretation, see how I'm couching this, of an eternal struggle between God and whatever, whoever Amalek is. Midor Dor, from a generation of a generation. Mm. A war, and and the the reading here, and then I, I want you to your opinion. But it's where it says a hand is against the throne or upon the throne. Some might interpret this. In fact, it's my current leaning 
that the throne is sort of the Malkut Shemaim, the kingdom of heaven. And, and I'm not trying to get too mystical, but it's hard not to consider these things. It's, it's like this uh, usurping hand is against the kingdom of God. And because of that, there's this war. What are your thoughts on that? Have I taken it too far, Jono? Uh, no, no. I think it's I think it's fair to speculate um, that that's the implication in the text. There's uh, now there's, it, it elaborates, I think, in what is it, Deuteronomy chapter twenty five. Yeah, we're I, go, right? we're going to go there next. We're going to go yeah. there in a minute, and I think and I think I borrowed a little bit from there already. What I find particularly conf- I'm going to say confusing, um, Ross, about both of these passages is that it commands us to memorialize the events, to blot them out uh, so that they will be mem- remembered no more. There's a somewhat of a conundrum to remember to forget or don't forget to get them. Um, yeah. And I'm not exactly sure how to understand that. Um, but to your point, um, from uh, generation to generation, it seems like uh, it's an ongoing struggle to to blot them out and forget and to not forget to do that. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a, a brain tease. How do you understand that? Now, that, that's it. that is something when you think about it. Now, the other thing, and it kind of plays into your question, the writer here, uh, I like to point out this is third person. So a mm-hmm. the author of this text is telling us uh, if you look at verse 14 of chapter 17 in Exodus, the Lord said to Moses, so this is someone telling us about God telling Moses to write this in a scroll or on a scroll. This is not the scroll itself. Mm. You, you see the point. But he's mm-hmm. saying, I want you to write this for a memorial, a zikron. It, so it's again, it's this idea of remember. Zakar means to remember. So write this um, ketov, ketov zot zikron. Write this as a memorial on or in the safer, the scroll, and uh, put it in the hearing of Joshua. So what I find interesting is that Exodus 17 tells uh, the story from a third person. Moses, mm-hmm. write this in a scroll. Deuteronomy 25 is the actual writing of this in a scroll is the way I understand it. So uh, uh, In a scroll, and, and this, of course, is the section that we refer to as the law code, well, that, is, that most scholars refer to as the law code, um, yep. which we might argue comes much later. So is it actually mosaic? Uh, we can discuss that perhaps some other time. But it is, well, um, do, you me, do you want me to read from this or...? Yeah, let, let's do 25, and then if you don't mind, Jonah, because you brought that up, mm. the writing in the scroll, the law code, uh, I have another of it, uh, another example of someone that I know other than Moses who wrote in this section of Deuteronomy. We won't mm-hmm. go into a lot of detail, but we can at least touch on it. But yeah, let's do Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19, I guess, right? Might be might be alluding to Samuel, or we'll come back to that. So yeah. uh, chapter 25, verse 17, remember what Amalek did, remember, it begins with remember what Amalek did to you on your journey after you left Egypt, how undeterred by fear of God, he surprised you on the march, and you were famished and weary and cut down all the stragglers in your rear. Therefore... When the Lord your God grants you safety from all your enemies around you, let me read that again. Therefore, yeah. when the Lord your God uh, grants you safety from all the enemies around you, in the land that the Lord your God is giving you uh, as a hereditary portion, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. Again, it's um, it is confusing. Remember what Amalek did, and when. Uh, when Amalek is no longer a problem, make sure you blot out Amalek. Don't forget. Ross. Yeah. No, I, I get your point. It's like uh, remember to not forget and uh, don't forget and blot the name out. But mm. it, I, it, at least, it, go ahead. Were you going to say something else? I'm sorry. No, no, that, that's exactly my point. It's, it's very confusing. Uh, it's, it's a little bit um, of a brain teaser. 
Yeah, it's so what we get though, I think even if we can get past that is that mm. it it is it is a very uh it it's a very how do I put this? There's no question that God wants these people, the people of Israel to never forget what Amalek did. Mm. And and understand that one day their name literally will be blotted out. The even the remembrance, and mm. and when you read what these people did, it is very reminiscent of what we just saw two weeks ago. Uh, even today, I saw a video that I had not seen until today, and I have been watching a lot of videos. Mm. And this was an interrogation of various of these terrorists that have been captured mm-hmm. and it it was it was sickening for one yeah. uh, but if as you listen to them it's all they're almost saying I'm Amalek you know just the nature yeah. of their cruelty it's but it's sick it is sick it is really really sick um uh, you, you, and and Patty evidently have uh, a stronger stomach than I do. I, I, uh, I, I just find it impossible to continually subject myself to this, um, uh, uh, to this. No. But uh, it certainly does give you an idea. So the question becomes, and just coming back to what you said, um, somebody else who may have written in the law in the law code. Were you referring to Samuel? Yeah, actually, I was. And and uh, mm. it's let's let me touch that for just a moment because. In, in a nutshell, very quickly, one thing that I would put forward in, in a very challenging way, and I've done a class on this, it's on my channel, about the monarchy. Uh, the monarchy, as I've put forward very, I think, uh, solidly in the, the teaching, Moses didn't write anything about the monarchy. Certainly by the time you get to 1 Samuel 8, uh, even though it's in Deuteronomy 17, see Deuteronomy tw- uh, 12 through 27 is part of what we call the law code. Mm. It stands apart from everything else we find in the Pentateuch. It's considered by the scholars to be very late for a lot of reasons, and mm. and there are more than a hundred laws found in this law code that we see nowhere else in the Pentateuch. One of them is the the monarchy. The Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20 says, when you come into the land, you're going to ask for a king, king like the nations, and, and so forth. Well, 1 Samuel 8, that happens. And remember the name Samuel, because it's going to come in on this other story, too. We're and, about and to go Samuel, there. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so let me, I'll, I'll wrap this up quickly. So 1 Samuel 8, the people, they are in the land. The people ask for a king like the nations. Samuel is upset. He tells God, the people have forsaken me. They've asked for a king. God said, they haven't forsaken you. They've forsaken me. Nowhere in this story, from 1 Samuel 8 to 1 Samuel 15, does anybody say, hey, wait a minute. It's in the law book. It said they were going to ask for this. So here's the proof. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25, God tells Samuel... Go ahead and give them a king and write it. You have to look at the Hebrew. He says, write Mm. it in the scroll and put it before Jehovah. Mm. So we know that, this is my my theory, I'm sticking with it, Mm. that Joshua wrote the law of the king, of the monarchy, the rules of the monarchy, and he puts it in the scroll, puts it before Jehovah, meaning... Samuel Samuel wrote. Samuel wrote. Yeah, what did I say? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, right. Samuel Samuel writes it and puts it before uh, the the uh, the throne, basically mm. before mm. the Ark of the Covenant. So your point your point is, if I if I'm understanding you correctly, then you're suggesting that uh, uh, parts of chapter 25 in Deuteronomy of the Law Code may also be of an earlier text that um, uh, may have been uh, enveloped into this section. Is that is that fair? Yeah, uh, let me say it the this monarchy. way. If if Samuel wrote the law of the king, mm-hmm. okay, uh, could he also have written the rule about Amalek? Or could he also now, have? Now, now stick with me. Well, okay. Because, no, we're good because we're about to go to chapter 15. Go ahead. 
Okay, so if we go to 1 Samuel uh, 15, Mm -hmm. what does it say um, about Samuel and Amalek? We start from the beginning. Yeah, man, you might as well. Let me let me say, are you are you already there? There. Samuel said to Saul, uh, "I am the one, Lord sent to anoint you king over his people. Therefore, listen to the Lord's command." Thus said the Lord of hosts, "I am exacting the penalty for what Amalek did to Israel, the assault he made upon them on the road on their way up from Egypt. Now, go attack Amalek, prescribe." All that belongs to him, spare no one. Now we're going to uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time here. Spare no one. Yeah. Kill alike men and women, infants and sucklings, oxen and sheep, camels and asses. Saw mustered the troops and enrolled them at uh, Telaim, and two hundred thousand men on foot and one and, and ten thousand men of Judah. Uh, then Saul advanced as far as the city of Amalek, oh, there's a city of Amalek, and lay yep. in wait in the wadi. Uh, okay, you want to keep going? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could keep either going. that or just tell the story. Either way, I'm good either way. Paul said to the Kenites, come, uh, withdraw at once from among the Amalekites that I may not destroy you among with them. But you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they left Egypt. So the Kenites withdrew from among the Amalekites. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. And Saul destroyed Amalek from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is close to Egypt. And he captured King Agag. He captured King Agag of Amalek yeah. alive. And he prescribed all the people, putting them to the sword. But Saul and the troops spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen and uh, and the second born, uh, uh, the second born, lambs and all else that was of value, uh, he gets in trouble for this. He would not prescribe yep. them. They prescribed only what was cheap and worthless. Where the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I made Saul king. He has turned away from me, and he has not carried out my commands. Samuel was distressed, and he entered. Uh, he entreated the Lord all night long. Early in the morning, Samuel went and met with Saul, and Samuel uh, was told Saul went to Carmel, where he erected a monument for himself. Uh, Then he left and went down to Gilgal. Uh, When Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, have fulfilled the Lord's commandment. Then what, commanded Samuel, is this bleating of sheep in my ears and the lowing of uh, uh, oxen that I hear? And uh, yep. Saul answered, "Well, I, 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 you know, I brought them from the Amalekites for the troops spared the choicest of the sheep and the oxen for sacrificing to the Lord your God, and we prescribed the rest." So I said to Saul, "Stop! Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night." But he replied, and Samuel said, uh, "You may look small yourself, but you are the head of the tribes of Israel. The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you a mission, saying, go and prescribe." The sinful Amalekites make war on them until you have exterminated them. Why did you not obey the Lord and swoop down on the spoil in uh, defiance of the Lord's will? Uh, Saul said to Samuel, but I I did obey the Lord. I performed the mission on which the Lord sent me. I captured King Agag of the Amalekites and I prescribed uh, Amalek and the troops uh, and uh, took from the spoil some of the sheep and the oxen and the best uh, that had uh, from the best that had been prescribed to sacrifice to sacrifice. That's why I did it. I just wanted to sacrifice to the yeah. Lord uh, at uh, Gilgal. But Samuel said, "Does the, and this is a famous uh, verse, isn't it? Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obedience to the Lord's command?" Uh, yep. It goes on, but it results in uh, Samuel. <laughs> This is pretty intense, i got to say, this whole section. Yeah, it's uh, pretty. You can just tell the story. Yeah, well, he um, uh, he goes back with um, uh, Saul, and uh, Samuel said, bring forward King Agag uh, of the Amalekites. Agag approached uh, with faltering step, yeah. Uh, and Agag said, ah, bitter death is at hand. And Samuel said, as your sword has bereaved women, so shall your mother be bereaved among men among women and samuel quote 
cut Agag down before the Lord at Gilgal. I think some translations, if I remember correctly, Ross says, cut him to pieces. Am I right about that? Yeah, pretty rough. It's rough stuff. This is uh, rough sounds stuff. pretty uh, brutal. Mm -hmm. But it, it is, just to kind of recap, I mean, the, the whole idea is that the promise was that ultimately uh, you, Amalek is going to be blotted out, and Saul is given that task to utterly blot out Amalek. And uh, because he doesn't follow through with this charge is the way it's presented, and he withholds for whatever reason, that ultimately it cost him the monarchy, and Samuel has to step in. Now, I, I, I mention just as a thought, it is, it is to me, I find it at least worth consideration that we find something between um, we we find some a connection between Samuel and the writing of the rules of the monarchy, and then we also find right past that in First Samuel this language, which is fairly close to what we see in Exodus seventeen and Deuteronomy twenty five. Mm -hmm. If you look at Exodus fifteen uh, verse two, and I know you covered this, but just quickly. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, utterly destroy all that they have, spare them not, and so forth. So this is the command to fulfill what was written in the other is the way it's most often presented. So I'm fine with that, but I'm just suggesting I see Samuel once again involved, and it's it's very close to the time frame that we saw the others. So yeah, yeah that is interesting. I, I, that's that's worth bringing up. Um, the next time that we hear about Amalek, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, no, there, there are a few times, um, but my mind is now going to uh, the Book of Esther. Do we do we want to jump there? Yeah, do that. Do that. That's a good. Uh, that's a good uh, passage in fact, of, of the book, especially in regards to plots against the Jewish people that we're seeing across the world right now mm. on the news media. I mean, it's, now, it's crazy. It is crazy. But we understand, uh, Ross, that um, uh, Haman is, a, is understood to be a, a descendant of the Amalekites. Is that right? That's what I read, yeah. And Haman is Who the knows? one that is... Uh, sorry? Yeah, Esther. Uh, yeah, Esther eight three. I think is where the reference is that he he might be uh, uh, related to the Amalekites. Amalekites. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Say, tell me what you're going to oh. tell me. Yeah. No, no. It's just like, like I'm looking at it now. It's the spoke to the king, falling at his feet and weeping and bese uh, beseeching him to avert the evil plotted by Haman the Agagite. So he's a descendant of Agag who just got chopped to pieces uh, by, by Samuel, right? Right. And Agag, we know, is the king of the uh, Malachites. Okay. So here's Haman uh, against the Jews. And the, uh, the king extended the golden scepter to Esther. Uh, and she puts to him um, the situation and that, uh, the, the plot that uh, Haman had devised. And the interesting thing about this, and this returns to um, uh, the whole uh, women and children uh, to, to blot them out entirely, including the women and the children. We see this again uh, in Esther chapter 8, verse 11, I think it is, where the king uh, gives permission to the Jews to defend themselves. And uh, it says, to this effect, the king had permitted the Jews uh, of every city to assemble and fight for their lives. If any what, people what, uh, prophets, what chapter? I'm sorry, what this was is the This is still chapter 8 in Esther, verse 11. Okay. Okay. If any people or province attacks them, they may destroy, massacre, and exterminate its armed force, together with women and children, and plunder their possessions. Mm. That's what the king gave them permission to do. And uh, it would appear that that's exactly what uh, uh, the Jews did. Uh, it doesn't say that explicitly, but it, it says that it took out, I think, something like 270-odd thousand uh, Persians, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Um, it's interesting. And so we read things like this, uh, and particularly in regards to Amalek, and we go, well, what are the rules of war, Ross? How, how do you understand yeah. it as far as the Hebrew Bible is concerned? 
Um, I think some of the rules of war uh, are are put put down in writing in Deuteronomy twenty. Would you agree? Is that that's? I think that's one of the main legal Deuteronomy texts. twenty. Let, let's go back yeah. there. Let's do that. Okay. Yep. Quite mm-hmm. right. And, um, and and again and again, we're going to have to do a show on this law code, chapter twelve through twenty seven. But mm-hmm. but again, this text is part of the law code. So just remember that as we're going through this. Mm-hmm. And I guess you're just going to kind of hit some of the high points, Jonah. Is that right? Yeah, and uh, I, I mean, we have, if I remember correctly, I think this section, you know, it tells us things like, you know, don't don't be cutting down the trees, uh, the fruit trees when right. you go to war to, to build, you know, this, that, and the other because it's your fruit, it's it's, it's food. Right. And yep. that's a law. Don't take out those trees, for example. Um, what else? Oh, we have, well, just before that, Ross, <laughs> first, now that's verse 19 and on and when you besiege a city. But just before that, it says, no, you must prescribe them, the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Pesuzites, the Hivites and the Jezubites, as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest they lead you into doing all abhorrent things that they have done uh, for their gods and you stand guilty before, before the Lord your God. Uh, in other words, yeah. you've got to wipe them out. It would appear uh, that is what the Lord Code is saying. In verse 14, we go back a bit further. You may, however, take as booty the women and the children, the livestock and everything in your town, all its spoil, and enjoy the use of the spoil of your enemy. So which is it? There uh, there are questions about uh, are you allowed to do what Saul did and uh, take some of the best of the, of the, um, uh, the spoil or yeah. are you supposed to prescribe everything, including their... Uh, uh, or, uh, herds and flocks and the women and the children. Your thoughts? I tell you, um, one of the most uncomfortable things, and it gets brought up quite a bit, especially when we're dealing with a situation like we are today, mm-hmm. uh, meaning at this time, is it's called harem, where the there is a ban, a total destructive ban, that's placed, uh, and and we read this in the Hebrew Bible. Even the children of Israel, as you've just covered here and elsewhere, mm. there is this. It comes up from time to time. But basically, mm-hmm. the whole book of Joshua is, you know, when you go in the land, you're going to utterly slay from you know man, woman, child, you know, the whole thing. Mm. So, so that is a very big part of the Hebrew Bible. And one of the comments I saw that flowed by, maybe we'll get some input on this is that uh, that's a practice among ancient people to, uh, I think these are my words, not the, the commoner's words, but it's, uh, it's almost like uh, embellished, you know, people maybe exaggerate the claims of what they did to their enemy. But these are some pretty gruesome texts, you know, go in and utterly. Now, there are three places in the Hebrew Bible, one more point, that 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 the the Hebrew Bible makes it plain that if you don't do this, if you don't utterly slay these people, then they're going to be pricks in your eyes and, a thorn, and thorns a in, thorn your in your flesh. Side and, and, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So so what yeah. are we to make of that? I mean, you know, that's, uh, and that's exactly what uh, Gaza is. I mean, we can certainly say that's exactly what Gaza is. And when the Arabs are chanting uh, uh, from the river to the sea, they are. Uh, uh, chanting for the uh, for the elimination, the total destruction of Israel, yeah, uh, and and of the Jews within the land. That's what they're calling for. And an unsolicited attack, uh, I think, gives one license to employ uh, of of that nature. Gives one uh, perhaps uh, license to employ these laws. Um, yeah. So there are questions that whether there's discussions we can have about whether or not these are. Um, uh, texts that are added later, if they're actually divine in nature, um, if that's uh, in fact what um, uh, God would have the people do. And uh, the reason why I bring that up is because when it comes to the Moses cry, I don't know if we want to go there just yet, you may have more to add, but there's room for consideration that that may not be the case, that the, the total destruction of men, women, and uh, of, of women and children and so on and so forth um, might be an addition 
to the yeah, text let me, of the website. R- right before you touch on that, I would say this. It's it's as if 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 you look at the academic approach, and you know, I mean, we have people in our audience that are uh, more orthodox in their understanding of the text and, and more textually oriented in, in a fundamentalist viewpoint. Mm-hmm. But so some would say, no, it says that this is what God said to do, and this is what they did. The academic world, based on archaeological evidence or their interpretation of archaeological evidence, is that the conquest, the going into the land and in just a few short years utterly you know, killing off most of the inhabitants of the land and so forth, the mm-hmm. view is that that is not the way uh, things went down. So, but again, that is that is a whole other argument as to whether or not these things went that way or not. But mm-hmm. but you have to wonder. You you made a statement a minute ago. If you look at what is going on in Gaza, you know, quite a few people now are saying, "Hey, look, the the rules of law of war, Deuteronomy twenty. You offer peace. Well, let let's talk about Gaza just for a second. And you offer peace." Did they offer, not only did they offer peace, Jewish inhabitants of Gaza were Mm -hmm. uprooted in 2005, taken forcibly from their homes, thousands, right, pulled Mm -hmm. from their homes. This land was given in an effort of goodwill for peace. Uh, It was not, you know, there there are no Jews. It's Judenrein, as we say. Mm -hmm. And and so no Jews, and uh, and so not only did they offer peace, but but almost immediately by I think two thousand and seven, mm. Hamas is elected by a majority of the people in the Gaza Strip, a vast majority. whose primary whose primary goal in writing is to utterly kill the Jews, which mm. brings us back to Haman, and you know if you think about it, I saw something this week. In the rotunda, in the capital of the United States, uh, you you get to see a lot of our crazy news on in Australia as well. The massive gathering of pro Hamas, mm. pro Palestinian Jewish people mm-hmm. who are saying, "Don't claim, don't do this on our behalf." They they want to be clear of this. And I couldn't help but think of Mordecai talking to Esther in chapter mm-hmm. 4 and verse 13 and, and basically just paraphrasing. He said, listen, if you don't help, God's going to save the Jewish people another way. Mm-hmm. But it could be. you know. So I'm thinking these are Jews, just like Esther was a Jew. But it, it just it's shocking to see everything that's going on you know, and I keep finding this Amalek parallel. I think it's quite, uh, it's almost shocking it, it shows up so much today. It is, it is shocking. And to Dave's point, uh, at the beginning, uh, before we started this program, we were talking to Dave, and he said, um, we are seeing a, a polarization uh, in the world. I mean, worldwide polarization. It's all about those who support Israel and those that don't. Um, it, it, it really, and, and one would be forgiven for thinking this is a fulfillment of prophecy. This is some sort of prophetic um, a moment in history that we're witnessing before our eyes. You certainly, certainly be forgiven for for speculating that. Um, yep. So, if I can perhaps uh, offer an alternative view based on the Moses scroll, can I have a can I have a crack at that? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Um, what I'm going to do is start with the uh, now. First off, it has to be mentioned that there is no mention of the um, of Amalek in the Moses scroll. Uh, that doesn't appear in the narrative as well. And that's not to say that it didn't happen. Uh, it yeah. may have happened. It's not in the scroll. Is it, it just should be mentioned. Um, what we have is uh, they are liberated from Egypt, and uh, they're at, and it begins when they're at Horeb. But he says to them, okay, you've dwelt long enough at this mountain. Send the mountain of the Amorite uh, and, uh, and go and take that land, basically. And the people say, well, uh, I say the people. We find out exactly who was responsible for this. Uh, it says the people say, well, they murmur and they say, oh, in hatred of us, to, you, you must hate us and you must want to eliminate us if you, want, if you think we're going to go up there and battle the, the Amorites. 
Uh, And so Elohim was angered and he said, well, uh, as I live, uh, all the people who have seen my signs and my wonders, which I did these 10 times since they have not listened to my voice, they will not see the good land that I swore to give their fathers, except their little ones, their little ones, Caleb and uh, the son of Yephunneh and Joshua bin Nun, who stand two men um, uh, that are exceptions. Uh, They will go there and I'll give it to, to them. Um, and it says, but uh, you're going to stay in, um, you, you think I'm setting you up to kill you? Well, how about this? How about you stay in Kadesh Barnea where you are and you just die there? Basically what he says, but he doesn't say it to everybody. He says it speci- specifically to uh, what is referred to as the men of the rebellion. Men who refused to take up arms and, and uh, carry out the commandment are the recipients of the, of the punishment. Not the children. Children are yep. not punished for the sins of their fathers. The children go and achieve the objective uh, as as they get older. But the men of the rebellion die out in Kadesh Barnea. They're the ones that suffer the consequences. My point is, is that it was the men that should have gone and engaged in battle with the Amorites. And yep. If we keep going and we get to and now, you just you just mentioned this, I think, um, in Deuteronomy, where it says that uh, Moses offered peace. Uh, yeah. First to the king of Sion, right? Uh, to to the king of the Amorites, uh, Sion. Is that is that? His well, name? I was I was just making the statement that in Deuteronomy twenty, one of the rules of war is when you're besieging a city, you offer uh, terms of peace, and if they refuse, then you know, then you do whatever. So that's and that's a, a law within yeah. the uh, law code. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. And. It says in Deuteronomy chapter two, verse thirty-two to thirty-seven. I mean, you can, you can open that up if you have the Bible handy. But uh, that um, Moses first extended uh, peace, you know, uh, a peace deal, and uh, he he rejected that, and then they engaged in battle. Uh, but in the Moses scroll, it says, "Oh, we went out to meet Sion towards Jahaz, and we smote him until no survivor remained to him." Um. And uh, the king of Heshbon, yeah, okay, the Amorite. And we captured all his cities from Aroa uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, Elohim gave before us. What is the addition, Ross, in uh, Deuteronomy, that section? Well, if I recall, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about Dershowitz's uh, understanding, when Dershowitz wrote his book on the Moses Scroll, one of the things that he says is that Deuteronomy uh it has to it has to have this idea about offering terms of peace because the law code says that hmm. uh but because th- now this is the academic view so people bear with me but the academic view that is that this came in later so then the text would have been edited in Deuteronomy 2 that a peace deal was offered in uh to this particular king and the Moses scroll was written at a time, I think is what you're saying, before this editorial process took place. So there wouldn't That's have been point. a need for this, that the men of battle go against men of battle for the other side, and they are supposed to wipe them out. It's, that's right. the story. That, that's certainly the story in the Moses scroll. But in the addition that appears, and, and you're right about what you've said, but also specifically in verse 34 of Deuteronomy chapter 2, at that time, we captured all his towns, and we doomed every every town, men, women, and children, leaving no survivor. So again, the yeah. difference is uh, uh, here we have, uh, and we went out to meet Sion towards Jehaz. We smote him until no survivor remained to him. Now, that could very well just be related to the men who engaged in battle that bear the risk of war. Yeah. Okay? Uh, but here in Deuteronomy, there's a very, very clear addition of women and children. We see the same thing when we get to um, King Og, uh, the king of um, Shan, also of the Amorites. Uh, and it says that they captured, uh, uh, they, they, oh, he went forth to meet them in battle. Who goes forth to meet, meet them in battle? It's the army, it's the men um, that, again, you know, take up arms and bear the risk of war. It says in the Moses scroll, and we smote him until no survivor remained to him. But in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 3, I think it is, let's see, do we have, I 
think we we're going to open up and have some. We're going to have some questions in just a couple of minutes. But keep going. I just wanted to let people know. I want to. We're going to hear some from our audience here in a minute. Mm-hmm. I'm just wondering if it has that addition in here as well. So uh, this is verse three of chapter three. The Lord God delivered into our power King Og of Bashan with all of his ah. Now it says with all of his men. He dealt with them such a blow that no survivor was left. At that time we captured his towns. Okay. So here with all of the men. Can I can right? I jump in? Can I jump in on one point, Jono? Oh, oh in, you in can, Deuter- but let me just finish. Before you do, it says, uh, okay. it goes on to say in verse 6, we doomed them as we had done in the case of King uh, Sion of Heshbon. We doomed every town, men, women, and children, and retain the booty as cattle, uh, all the cattle and the spoils of the town. So it does. It adds that uh, once again. And these, um, uh, this specification doesn't appear in the Moses scroll. Go ahead, Ross. So uh, I want to make something really crystal clear here because up until now, people might be listening to us and they're saying, wait, how do these two guys, how do they even know that something is added later? If it, Let's say someone has the view that Moses wrote this whole text, and there's nothing later. Well, look at Deuteronomy 2 with me, Jono. Uh In Deuteronomy chapter 2, we're just talking about this, verse 9, And the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab. You with me? Uh Nor contend with them in battle, for I will not give you for their of their land for a possession, because I've given R to the children of Lot for a possession. Hmm. The Amim dwelt there in times past, a people great and many and tall like the Anakim, who also are considered Rephaim as the Anakim, but the Moabites call them Amim. Get ready. Hmm. Uh, the Horim also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them, and they destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their place, as Israel yes, did to the land. What? And this is it. As, and, and this is the yeah, place to and emphasize. As Israel, as Israel did to the land of his possession, which the Lord gave to them. So this text is written at a time after mm-hmm. the conquest, uh, af- much after Moses has been dead. Because And so here we have an example of a text of the conquest which is making its way into an earlier text. So if mm-hmm. that can happen, and it did, I want everybody to read this carefully on their own and make this their mind up, but it's very clear that what we have is a much later author, once Israel has totally controlled the land, someone from that period is putting into a text as if it's contemporary with Moses when it is not. Mm -hmm. To your point. No, quite right. Um, This follows into another story, and this is the story, of course, when they're at uh, Beit Peor. And the daughters of Moab went forth at that time, and the women of Midian to you, and they called to you, they enticed the men to eat of their sacrifices and you ate of their sacrifice and you drank of their libations and you bowed to their gods and you whored with the Midianite women and you were joined by al Peor in that day. The anger of Elohim burned against you and there was a plague. And uh, and then it says, and I, Moses speaking the first person, I sent men from you to battle the Midianites and you smote them with the edge of the sword and you captured from them many captives and the pra- plague was restrained. Uh, again, we see that the men go into battle and uh, and deal with the situation and engage with the men of, of Midian. Um, it's interesting because what is missing from this text, which appears in the Pentateuch, is that uh, the Pentateuch goes on to say, well, you know, they came back with um, uh, captives. I think there may be, and, and this maybe I'll uh, let people look at this later on, there may be a um, an argument to be made that uh, the men of Israel went and retrieved or returned captives that were taken during this enticement. Maybe. Maybe that's the yeah. cap- uh, captives that are returned. Or maybe these are the spoils of war, perhaps. But on, on the latter, we've seen the Pentateuch that uh, Moses says, why have you brought all of these ones back? It's the women that enticed the men in the first place and you brought them back. And then he, yeah. he tells them, 
uh, in according to the the Hebrew Bible, according to the Pentateuch, it says, check which ones are virgins and which ones aren't. The ones that aren't, just kill them, and uh, keep the ones that haven't known a man, and and uh, and kill all the males and so on and so forth. It's really brutal, absolutely brutal. Uh, missing yeah. from the Moses scroll. And the only other text that I just want to highlight is uh, just after the, uh, and this is in, uh, what's this, GB, um, uh, GC4, for those that have their, their copies of the Moses scroll there. Um, among the, uh, the curses and the blessings, this is just before the blessings, it says, if you will only guard all of the commandments which I'm commanding you today, do them to love your Elohim, to walk in all his ways and in all his statutes, and Elohim will dispossess all of the men of the place upon which your, uh, the sole of your feet tread. No man shall stand before you uh, for fear of you and dread of you uh, will be upon the face of the land upon which you tread. Um, so there's definitely room, I think, in my mind, if we give the benefit of the doubt to the uh, Moses Scroll as an authentic document, uh, perhaps the original upon which the uh, the Torah is based, that uh, the idea of uh, genocide, what some might describe as genocide, uh, or, or prescribing all uh, to the sword, taking out the women and the children, together with the, the with the actual fighting men who who I say uh, once again, bear the risk of war by taking up arms, uh, by taking them all out together, it may not be. Um, the original practice of the Israelites. Well, okay. So this is this is some pretty interesting things. We're gonna we're gonna open this up for uh, some of our guests to uh, maybe bring some comments or insights from their perspective. But what we've covered tonight then is that Amalek is presented as an age long enemy of Israel. Whether mm -hmm. that is to be taken in a literal sense or Maybe it was put in at a later point, but either way, mm -hmm. there is this idea that against the throne of God, the mm -hmm. establishment of God's kingdom, if you will, uh, there is a, a hand against that. There is, uh, and it, it is embodied in a term, the Bible, a name the Bible calls Amalek, the arch mm -hmm. enemy of Israel. Uh, we also talked about some other things, Jonah. You brought up very interestingly the idea that one thing which bothers people, I think, is when we read in the Bible, it says, go into this place and kill them all, men, women, children, babies, you know, and, and then if somebody has a problem with that, you go, oh, excuse me, that sounds horrible, and you say, hey, God's ways are higher than our ways, you know, and people say, I don't, I don't like that. What you're suggesting is, is that maybe this idea of harem, of a ban to destruction of men, women, and children, might have been written at a later date and was not part of the original Torah. And that's interesting, and we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 2 at least one text which clearly shows a later addition uh, into this area uh, or into this time period. So who hmm. knows? Let's see what there, we have I mean, out are, here. By the way, there yeah. are other um, uh, passages in uh, in the Hebrew Bible that would again lend to that idea. So, for example, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter thirty four, uh, when uh, the prince of Shechem has taken uh, Dina, uh, yep. Shimon and Levi uh, took their swords, came against the city while, and this is verse twenty five, uh, while it felt secure and killed all the males. Um, they killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dina out of Shechem and so on and so forth. But um, they plundered the city. They took their, their uh, flocks and their herds, the donkeys and all of that sort of stuff, uh, and all their wealth. Didn't, and all they, the didn't, ones... they even, didn't they hamstring the horses? And Oh, think... harsh stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's cruel. And, that's, uh, and, and even their little ones and their wives, uh, all that was in their houses, they, they, they took out the men. Uh, of the city, um, Numbers chapter twenty-four. When uh, yep. Numbers chapter fourteen, sorry, when the people grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, "Oh, that we had died in the land of Egypt! You know, now you've brought us out here to die in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Uh, to fall by the sword? It seems that the men are saying that, and they say our wives and our little ones will become prey. 
In other words, they'll die by the sword, and and the wives and their and their children uh, will be taken as um, uh, plunder, if you like. Yeah. Um, we see this again in uh, Numbers thirty-one. I think the the people of Israel took captive the women of Mijan. We, we talked about that, uh, and we've already talked about Deuteronomy chapter twenty um, when it talks about uh, uh, in that case the. Um, uh, the, the the woman uh, that they may see, you know, when they're when they've taken out uh, all the men, and they may see a woman that they desire, and all of that. And that's a hey, isn't that the one? Isn't that the one well. where the? Isn't that the one where the? If if you see a woman that you that's desirous mm-hmm. of your, you, you can take her, and you, you have to shave her head, get her fingernails, fingernails. done, and mm-hmm. then you can't. Uh, Sleep with her for like thirty days so she can mourn days, her family. Mourn her, yeah, and then and then somehow that, that you killed. Imagine, yeah, yeah, that you just that you just took out, uh, and then somehow we're to imagine that she accepts her fate and uh, becomes the wife of of her. Um, and captor. lives happily it's ever very, after. Very very odd, and once again uh, gives us reason to pause and wonder: Is this actually something that's added later, or is this actually a divine uh, command? Um, that's now let me let me throw. I'm sorry. Let me let me throw one other point in. Even if someone says these are the beliefs of ancient Israel, hmm. they're no longer the the actions of Israel. Israel no longer acts like this, hmm. and and yet their enemies still act like this. This is the point. So their enemies still go in with this mentality. I listen to the testimony of these captives, uh, these terrorists that they're talking to today. You could almost say they're religious fundamentalists, except that they. one question was interesting. They were asking them, does the Quran tell you to kill and burn people alive? And they, they would say, no, it doesn't say that in the Quran. Does it say that you should kill women and babies? And, it's, and they said, no, that's forbidden. But did you do it? And they said, yes, we did it. I found that was very interesting because, uh, because not only did they, did they say, hey, look, we know it doesn't say this in our holy book, but we did it anyway. I think mm-hmm. that, that was quite telling. And, and so uh, one thing now, that struck me, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it is interesting. Maybe this is where you're going. Is that this is what they said? It's not in that they say it's not in our holy book, but we did it anyway. And yet, when we see the response of of Israel, you could easily say, well, it is in their holy book, and they're not doing it. So what's happening is they are they're they're dropping leaflets saying we're going to go hard in northern uh, Gaza. You need to move to the south if you don't want to be a part of this. By all means, move to yeah. the south. We'll give you a twenty four hour window. Go now. Because we're not kidding around, they turn off the electricity and the and the uh, and the water and and um, and the fuel and everything in the north, uh, so that people will gravitate to the south, where there is water, where there is fuel, where there is um, uh, electricity, and a lot of people have moved to the south. Now, if uh, Egypt really cared about these people, they'd open up the border and and uh, set up um, you know care centers and hospitals and so on and so forth on the other side of the border. But they're not interested. They don't want the Palestinian people, the Gazans, in in their territory because it's just going to be an absolute headache, of course. So right. they're not doing that. But uh, but Israel is saying, hey, move down here while we deal with Hamas up here and the Hamas infrastructure. So they're, uh, they're not conducting themselves to the passages, uh, according to the passages that they just read. It seems like they're conducting themselves more uh, according to the Moses scroll, Ross. Interesting. Interesting. Hey, let me ask you this. Do we have any questions out there? Any comments? Anyone want to take the microphone and uh, and give us some of your input? I've, I've seen some, uh, I can't keep up with the text, but I've seen some good comments that I'll try to read over. Uh, but do we have anyone who wants to talk? Uh, we would love to hear some of your opinions, some of your comments, some of your insights. The good thing about this group is we have a lot of people who are really studying. Let me let uh, Betty. Hey, Betty. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Betty? I can. Oh, wow. Last week it didn't work. Cool. 
Well, now I'm all nervous. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go ahead. I, I almost uh, left because all of this, it's like Patty. I can hardly stand it. It just mm. really, really, really bothers me. But I heard a teaching today by, I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, Jeremy Gimple and Ari Abramowitz. Mm -hmm. sure. um, but Jeremy's wife, uh, Tehila, uh, taught something on Psalm 140. And she brought up that it mentions the word Hamas or Hamasim times mm -hmm. in the Psalm. And it is just very, very, very interesting because David is asking God to protect him from Hamasim, from these um, violent, violent men mm. or evil men. Uh, it's in verse 3, uh, verse 5, and then mm. later on in verse 12. But the interesting thing is that in verse 11, it says, and of course, we know that in the end, they're destroyed, but it says in verse 11, let them be cast into fire into deep pits so that they do not rise up again. Mm. It just seems to me that the deep pits could very well be the tunnels that they have dug for, you know, yeah. to... Sure, and why not? I mean, we're hearing more and more about the elaborate uh, and sophisticated tunnel system uh, that extends for, for miles and miles underneath uh, the city yeah. of Gaza and the land of Gaza. So, um, you know, may it be. I mean, I, I hope that is very well the case. Uh, that's certainly but what Israel is. Uh, point. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that the interesting thing is, I mean, she's Jewish. I think she's, pro I think she's Orthodox. But she mm, made, yeah. made the point that the last couple of verses say, I know that Hashem, God, uh, Jehovah, will maintain the cause of the afflicted sight of the poor surely the righteous shall give thanks to thy name and the upright shall dwell in thy presence mm. so she's saying that the righteous is not just the jew the righteous is everyone that mm. chooses to be on the side of good sure and um the one the ones that are yashar is the upright uh, yeah. because that's what that's what god is looking for Mm -hmm. But right. you know, it was just really, really, really interesting. I did post her teaching on United Israel and on my Facebook page as well. Very so good. I'll check that out. Worth listening to. Uh -huh. Hey, thanks, you Betty. Bet. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, All right, Karen. Karen. Yeah. How are you, Karen? Good. Can you hear me? I can, can hear you. Hear Go you. ahead. Okay. Um, so I have two things. One question. Do you know why um, Be Balaam calls Amalek the first of nations? First of nations. Yeah, that, that is a really curious thing. So some scholars suggest that it is indicative of, um, of the antiquity or, or the longevity of, um, of uh, the Amorite um, it it may be. I mean, the the question I always ask when it comes to this is who wrote this portion and when and when was it mm -hmm. written? Ross, what what are your thoughts on this? Well, no, I I was going to let you keep rolling with it. It sounded good. I looked at that as well. It's it's always one of those texts which uh, when you do the. I'm glad Karen brought it up. I could almost mm. figure that Karen was going to bring that up. Mm -hmm. I know how she studies a lot like this. So mm -hmm. the first occurrence when it says that it's the first of the nations. You know, I, I have to wonder if if at that time, at the time of the writing, let's say that Bilam is from the time of Moses. Let's put, let's mm -hmm. give it that. Uh, if that's the case, then that would say that these people are looking at the Amalekites as being a very, very early ancient people. Other than that, I don't have any insight, but I have done quite a bit of digging to see if there's anything else. But I don't know. Do you have any thoughts, Karen, uh, that maybe you ran into when you were studying? Or Well, I know there's a Bilam ex, um, inscription somewhere, but I can't remember where it is or what it says. I I actually, we've seen that on the Tanakh tour, and, and God willing, you'll be with us when we go again. It's in mm -hmm. Jordan, and it okay. was at Deir, Deir Allah. At Deir right. Allah, it's on the east side of the Jordan. It's in Jordan, 
and that inscription is is in a museum. Jonah and I did a show on it some time back, and mm-hmm. the joke is it's actually in red letters. You know right. this uh, this inscription. Some mm-hmm. people propose that Bilam, because this seems to be a story about a real Bilam who is a prophet. Uh, but yeah. it's dated to the Iron Age, if I'm not mistaken. And so some suggest that the story of Bill Um in our Bible comes from, uh, it's anachronistic, it's later, but it's written as if it's at this time. Yeah, because uh, he is, uh, Bill Um is, is recognized as some, uh, a figure in history of, of particular note, you know, some, mm-hmm. he has a reputation and wouldn't it be good if we could have a story that includes him? The question uh, I ask is well, who re- who recorded? Who was privy to this information? This detailed yeah. information. Who was privy to this information by which it made its way into the Hebrew Bible? Uh, yeah. If it is true, I mean, who was the spy that listened in and was privy to the conversations between Balak and Bilam and the blessings that were actually given? Right. Um, uh, in in fact, who was there during um, um, Bilam? You know. Going along with it, the, and then his donkey was talking to him, and then an angel appeared. So, who was there that recorded all of this, and it made its way into the Hebrew Bible? Is my question. Uh, right. So, I, I really it could have been an older text that was copied. Is my assumption? Yeah. It's yeah. right, yeah. or something that's put they're referring into, to something that they read. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let, let me say one other thing while while you're on, Karen. You you don't have to answer this, but you can. But since it's it's the three of us on the microphones right now, one idea we do know from the biblical record that from Samuel, from First Samuel fifteen particularly, uh, we we get that a a group called the Amalekites were the enemies of Israel during the monarchical period, and and what if? What if the stories that are we're familiar with about Amalek, certainly in that time, they were the daily news. This is the enemy. And then the story grew from there. It not only grew uh, forward in time, like this is going to be a war forever, but it also looked back. And the writer wanted us to see that this has been an age-old enemy. And it's almost as if maybe this uh, this story comes that not only is Amalek was Amalek a, an enemy when they came out of Egypt, but Amalek is the first of the nations, you know, and it pushes oh. it back, back, back. The, there is that tendency uh, in ancient storytelling that that sometimes exaggerates. You know, we we make our enemies bigger than life; they're crueler than cruel. Uh, and, and there is a tendency to do that. We see it not only in the Hebrew Bible, we see it in other ancient literature as well. It's not, it's not false, it's, it's ancient storytelling. We mm-hmm. get examples of this in uh, one other thing I'll say, and then I'll be quiet so people can't answer. But, but one thing we see is the children of Israel, when they go in, not only are the inhabitants of the land giants, but they're so big that we're like grasshoppers. And and so there, you know, it's that idea, and and I think sometimes when we read that, the people weren't literally small as grasshoppers. And right, it's an exaggeration. Yeah, yeah. So so I think maybe some of that creeps in. Maybe right. some okay, of that I creeps in. Maybe... Oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was going to say I got one more thing. Um, so in regard to Haman, you know, he comes home. And I see this as a parallel of what's going on. He comes home from after seeing the king and being invited to dinner by Esther, and he tells his wife, "You know, I'm the I'm the second most powerful person in the land, only to the king. And the queen wants to invite me to dinner, and look how important I am." And then he says, "But it's all for nothing, because Mordecai still exists." And I feel like that's like a similar attitude with Palestinian people. You can give them anything they want. You can give them everything they ask for. And they're still going to be unhappy. Millions of dollars in funding and, uh, and right. so on and Israel so forth. Still and they use it to build terror tunnels. That's right. And missiles. Yep, absolutely. That is, absolutely. that is. I think that's one reason why Egypt doesn't want them and Jordan doesn't want them is because they're like this. Not just with Israel, but I think with the, anywhere yeah. they're at. Mm-hmm. Wherever you go, there you are. Yep. That is an excellent insight. It's, uh, y- there's no end to, and, and like Jonah mentioned a while back earlier, it, it's, 
They don't want a two-state solution. They want nothing less than the eradication of the entire Jewish population. Mm. They, they don't want to split anything. From the first time, uh, you know, in 1947, when the two-state solution was offered, when the petition plan was presented, uh, even though Israel's portion was reduced, even during the talks, Israel said, okay, we'll take it. And mm. the Arab population said no. That they they have said no to everything, no matter what was offered, because they don't want to share. They want the Jews dead, just yeah. like Haman. And yeah. my my prayer is that that those who seek the demise of God's people, that just like in the story of Esther, that it comes back on them. I mean, right. that's what I would hope for. I'm not a, yeah, a warmonger, not you know, but still. Hey, those are good comments. What? What? Give us another one, Karen. You got any more up your sleeve? Um, right. I don't know. What did? Mm. What so? Am means nation. Lek means what? I don't know what the name Amalek means. I could. I would have to look doesn't, that doesn't up. Doesn't Am sure. like mean nation? Like Am um, this and Am um, that? I don't know Hebrew very it, well. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd have to look at one, the spelling. I, I think it's. I think uh, I think there's I, a, a rabbinic interpretation that says it means those who lick, and the implication is those who lick blood. Um, okay. But I, I think that's probably I don't I don't know how. Uh, yeah, let me. I'll look at the spelling of it, and um, but off the top mention, of my head, do we find mention of Amalek in um, archaeological record and anywhere else, like in what the way the Hebrew Bible calls them? Because I know sometimes they can be known by a different name. No. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, I don't I, know I, that my there understanding, is. yeah, my understanding is there is no archaeological evidence for um, uh, people of Amalek. Okay, that's, they that's show my up. They they show up and and they have this ancient pedigree that no one can bow, uh, back up, and mm. uh, and they're just presented mm. as this age long enemy of the people of Israel. So you have to wonder. I think mm. when we look at what we see today. You pointed out the very uh, comparison between Amalek and Haman, and, and even what we see today, mm. there is no satisfying, there is no craving. One of the videos I watched today, one more point, it's a recording that a one of the fanatics calls his parents from a Jewish woman's phone. It's just audio, and it's it sounds like this person is... Just their adrenaline is pumping, pumping, pumping. And and the it's in Arabic, but it has subtitles. And he, he says, uh, Abba. And you hear the person say, yeah. And he says, I killed 10. I killed 10 Jews with my own hands. He said, "I'm look at your pictures. He said, look on WhatsApp right now. Look what, look on. And he's going on and on. He's so just foaming. He's just excited, excited. The mother gets on, and the parents are so proud of this person, the, their child, mm. who's committed these horrible, these horrible crimes. And while I was listening to this, one of the things that I thought was, the media wants us to believe that this is a very small group of bad actors among a peaceful group. You know, most of these people are just sweet and they love life. Uh, but I can't imagine, I mean, yet to, to, to imagine that that's the case, that would mean that this bad person was a person of Hamas. And that mm -hmm. he just so happened to have the approval of his parents to be in Hamas. It, it, it's, you can't believe it. I can't believe it. I think that there are yeah. far more of these who hate the Jewish people and want them dead. And it's hmm. one of the reasons that I'm getting more and more interested in this book by Caroline Glick, uh, hmm. The Israeli hmm. Solution, A One-State Plan. I think it's the only way forward for whatever that's worth um, because how do you have neighbors who will sneak over and kill your whole family, burn them alive? It's, un it's unbelievable. Yeah, you don't. It's it's uh it's Hamas. Hamas is Amalek. 
Hamas is ISIS, yeah. yes, but Hamas is Amalek. That's what it is. It's the age, the manifestation of the age-old enemy that sought to destroy Israel. And uh, maybe to Jonah's point, Israel failed in the past to eradicate these bad people, and maybe we have one more chance, and maybe that's what should happen. Mm. That's what Israel's right. saying they're going to do now. Yeah, that when, on the interview I listened saying. to with uh, Bennett, with former PM Bennett, he said, we're done listening to you. Naftali? We, we should have. Mm. Yeah, Naftali Bennett. He uh, mm. told BBC, we're, we're done listening to you. You told us to do this, you told us to do this, and the, the lady's like, well, that's not our fault. And he's like, you're right, it's not your fault. It's our fault for listening to you, and we're not going to listen to you anymore. We're going to do what yeah. we need to do. Yeah, that's right. So hopefully they do. That's right. Well, Karen, we're going to get to go to Israel and, and uh, Jordan and Egypt hopefully one day soon, and we will look at that Deir Allah inscription, and we'll talk about this again. How's that for a plan? Sounds good to me. All right. Hey, thanks for your insights. Good stuff. What, and look, if you find before I do, I did look a little bit at the meaning of Amalek, and um, the Ayin Mim, if, if, it's, if it's a compound word in some way, which I don't know that it is, but Am does mean people. and um, mm. But the Lamed and the Kof, I'm not sure what that could be. Uh, I know that there are probably rabbinic suggestions, but I just couldn't find anything mm. that I could say etymologically, checkmark, right. that's what it means. You know, so like, uh, uh, whereas a lot of names are something. easy. Yeah, some, some names are pretty easy and straightforward, and some, some names not so much. Okay, I got okay. Uh, another call. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. And Morgan, I think we just gave you permission to grab that microphone. How are you, sir? Uh, you've Morgan. got to unmute, un unmute your um, yeah. microphone there. Let me see if I can unmute him. Morgan, if you look, you should have, it might be in the lower left of your screen, there might be a microphone picture with a red line through it. If you click that, you can unmute. We've got you on the stage, so we'll just keep you there as you work through that. Um, anyone else while we wait on Ben Michael? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, while uh, he's uh, seeing if he can rectify that, uh, Doug uns uh, asked a, a question, um, and he said, I think the question should be asked, uh, what is God's purpose in all of this? Might this not be his way of calling secular Israel back to himself? Um, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I know um, when we look at the Holocaust, for example, uh, a lot of people turned away and said, how can, how can a God exist if he allows this to happen to uh, his his um, so-called chosen people. Uh, others um, had had the opposite effect and did uh, return to a, a more religious lifestyle. I, I don't know that an event like this um, would 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 turn people. I think if if people are already uh, religiously inclined, then they're inclined to uh, turn to God in in prayer and. Um, and so on and so forth. I don't know about turning secular people back to God. I, I know it remains to be seen. What's your What's your thoughts on that, Ross? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's. Uh, I see the question, and it's. It is a very difficult question, and it's mm. even more complicated, exacerbated by the fact that it. It's a question of asking me in my state to to say what I think God's doing with it. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know, but uh, I and, think and it looks way, like... Ross, I, I don't think that this is something that God has done. I don't think this is a thing that he has yeah. done. This is a, um, uh, something that's been in, uh, planned by the enemies of Israel for two years out of their own free will, uh, hell-bent on, on destroying Jews. Um, this yeah. is just the nature of, of free will, and uh, we have to... It allows for people sometimes to do horrible, terrible, disgusting things. Um, yeah. What the effects will be, we remains to be seen. Uh, do we have Morgan? 
I think we yeah. do. Morgan is ready yep. and his mic is free. Phone. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to throw out that um, listen to a or watch the video on YouTube by um, uh, uh, Who is Amalek, the Bible Mystery by Seth Fleischman. Uh, he, has a, okay. uh, he has a channel called World History by a Jew and, and he goes all the way back to the Sea Peoples and and um, it's just very interesting. He does say that, like John have said, there's not a, a, a much, if any, archaeological evidence, but the uh, consequential evidence is very strong of, of what he comes up with. So uh, mm -hmm. I just, if you want to know more about it, you know, go, go to that uh, Seth Fleischman's YouTube channel and uh, make up your own mind. If you <laughs> If you have if you have that link, uh, feel free to put it in the comments there. Um, okay, uh, Morgan, sure. that that that'd be handy. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, yeah. no, Joe, that that would be good because we can also add that as uh, you know we can point to his channel. So so that's a okay. good good idea. Good enough, and thank you, Seth, John, and Ross for doing this. You right. And we can get getting us all together. Appreciate it. Uh, hey, to it's to good you. to have you. Good to have you. Okay, so uh, let's see. We've got um, Eric. Eric. Let me see. Did uh, did I invite him? I don't know if I. There he is. Can you? Do you got him? Put on, unmute your mic there. There you go. Go uh, ahead, mate. Yeah, no, you invited me, and you got to click twice to get it to open up. It looks like. All right. Uh, what what We're I was ready. gonna what I was gonna throw in was that uh, when you were talking about. Uh, why did this happen and whether it's from Yehovah or not, it's been pointed out to me that there's an awful lot of similarity to what was going on here in Israel of late as compared to before the destruction and uh, carrying off of both northern Israel and southern Israel and the destruction of the temples, there was a lot of infighting, power grabbing, trying to be the big man on the totem pole in all three cases. And the only way they could be corrected was him take them out of the land, get rid of the man-made junk, and start over. The righteous would return, they would try to start again, the unbelievers would start, and I'm talking about Israel, the other tribes, whatever you want to call them. I call them all Israel. But today, I mean, before this started, there was such factions in Israel. It seemed like it was almost like the House of Representatives in the U.S. Congress. A bunch of kids screaming and yelling. All this infighting between everybody who should be an Israelite should be an American first as opposed to me, me, me. I want the power. Even though I'm not of the tribe of Judah, I'm going to be the priest and all. And that's my rant. Thank I think, you I think what you're saying, if, if I understand what you're saying, Eric, uh, you're saying that this, this unfortunate event has brought about a lot more unity in the um, uh, political arena of, uh, of, of Israel. And, you know, that, that is true. Uh, Absolutely. And as, yeah. as Dave, uh, and as I mentioned in our in our discussion with Dave before the program, uh, he points out quite rightly that the world is now polarized. Uh, and seemingly, those who are for Israel and uh, and those who are against um, yes. events like this do do polarize, and and those that are for are much more unified and strengthened in their position than perhaps they were before um, with each other. So. You know, it, it is sad too, in a way. And and by the way, Doug had commented earlier, and he is agreeing with Eric that that's his point. Um, you, you know, it, it what's so tragic is that sometimes it takes a horrible event like this. Not that the event is God's judgment necessarily, but it takes a horrible event like this to bring people together, to rally and bring out the best in people. We are seeing, even though there's war and there's all this death and we still have, I mean, we still have 200 captives, 200 oh. prisoners, and there is more and more videos. This is 
horrible. But in the midst of this, we're seeing people come together. Israelis come together and they're putting aside their differences and they're rallying together for the good. We see, uh, you know, some of my friends are posting on social media that they're taking up clothing and they're opening their homes to people who uh, were basically, they had to leave their home because of the horrible mm. things that happened in the South. And you know what they're not saying? Who now? What political party are you? They're saying you're mm. you're a Jew. Come come stay with me. Come right and yeah, uh, good point. yeah. So I think that it's. I I always have a very. This is just me. It's not that I, I'm giving my decision on it, but I know a lot of people think differently. But there, I live. I've mentioned this before. I live in an area where we have bad storms, hurricanes. And hurricanes have a tendency to aim for New Orleans from time to time. And what people typically say is, well, you know, New Orleans is, uh, those people live really in a wicked way. Maybe this is God's way of, you know, killing a bunch of them. I, look, I, I, don't, I don't think that way. But, uh, I, but I know some people, and, and some people rely on text from the Bible to say, well, you know, God brought the enemies and, okay, well... Anyway, that's just. Uh, I, I hear what I, you're I saying. I tend to not I, I, go I agree with, with that. Yeah. yeah, and I and I wouldn't be um, uh, jumping to that conclusion, declaring that publicly. That, uh, uh, mind you, when I was a fundamentalist, I might have been more inclined to do so. Right. Uh, and is that Ross? Um, I'm. <laughs> I hate to do this, but I'm going to have to go. I've I've uh, I've got another appointment. I got to wrap this up. But before that's okay. We, that, we need to, to go speak. anyway. Yeah. Well, before we do, I just wanted to see if um, uh, if you could fill us in on what you're doing this coming Saturday. Well, this Saturday is not totally ironed out uh, as ah, as it goes. I started a nice. class last week. I did a class on the land of Israel, a biblical mandate, and I really didn't finish everything I wanted to do. So I told Seth, I think I'm going to continue that, uh, mm -hmm. but I've got some ideas to develop that I just you know, you, you only go for an hour, so I didn't quite finish what I was doing. So I think I want to take that to the next one, uh, next class, and go a little bit further in that and just take that through the profits and so forth. So, All right. Okay. So uh, Ross K. Nichols on YouTube uh, this coming right. Saturday morning. Um, anything else that you want to throw in before we go, my friend? No, I want to say thanks to everybody. Uh, mm. We're going to practice this a little bit. We're going to tweak it a little bit more and uh, look forward to, uh, to doing this again with you next week. So, hey, it's always fun. It's exciting. And, and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Will do.